After Jurassic Park 3 came out, it took 14 years for its sequel, Jurassic World, to hit theaters. And during that time, the script to Jurassic World, then known as Jurassic Park 4, went through several different versions. And one of those versions was a radical departure for the franchise, featuring human dinosaur hybrids, as well as a bunch of other insane ideas. So let's dive in and find out what could have been Jurassic Park 4. After Jurassic Park came out in 1993, director Joe Johnson, famous at that point for directing Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and The Rocketeer, ran into Steven Spielberg at a screening and told him that he loved Jurassic Park and to keep him in mind to direct a sequel if Spielberg didn't want to direct it himself. And Steven said, Joe, I think I'm going to do the second one, but if I do a third, you're my first choice. So when we decided to do the third movie, Stephen immediately went to Joe. Unfortunately, after all those years, Johnson never bothered to come up with an idea for one. And as Jurassic Park 3 would hurtle towards production, it would go through a series of different scripts before production would begin without a completed one, as Johnson struggled to settle on a story. William H. Macy, who starred in the film, was very critical of this, saying, The script has been evolving and being rewritten as we go. And what you want to say is, who launched a $100 million ship without a rudder? And who is getting fired for this. I think someone should be shot, but I'm not in charge. So if you're always wondering why Jurassic Park 3 wasn't any good, there's your answer. Alan. Uh, Alan. But before the film was even complete, Spielberg was already looking towards the future and asking himself what the next film should be about. And the idea he would have, he would proclaim as the best story since the very first movie, stating regretfully that he wished they made it as the third film instead of what we got. But it was too late for that as the third entry in the franchise was still being shot. After Jurassic Park 3 was finished and heeding Macy's advice, Spielberg would ensure that he had a great script written before before going into production on Jurassic Park 4, which is why there was such a long delay between Jurassic Park 3 and Jurassic World, as Spielberg and his team struggled to get the script and story just right. Producer Kathleen Kennedy would echo these sentiments, stating, we don't want to make the movie if there's not a reason to make the movie. So we've kind of created a dilemma for ourselves because it was never intended to be a franchise. So we've got to find a good reason for why we're doing a fourth Jurassic Park, and we're in the midst of working on that right now. Spielberg's first attempt at the script, which he'd get William Monaghan of The Departed fame to write, would take place 12 years after the first movie, with John Hammond's dinosaurs having become the stuff of urban legend, with many skeptical they ever existed. I guess without smartphone cameras back then, nobody grabbed a video of a T-Rex rampaging through the streets of San Diego. Although this does remind me of the start of Ghostbusters 2, where the events of the previous film are also largely forgotten or treated as some sort of elaborate hoax. My dad says you guys are full of crap. Jason, well, gosh. some people have trouble believing in the paranormal. No, he just says you guys are full of crap and that's why you went out of business. The story would have seen dinosaurs migrating to the Costa Rica mainland and attacking the locals. Upon discovering that the dinosaurs are coming from a nearby island where they're breeding at an uncontrollable rate, a team of experts led by Alan Grant, Ian Malcolm, and John Hammond's granddaughter, to be played by Kira Knightley, chart an expedition to the island to try and find a way to curb the spread of the dinosaurs and prevent more from reaching the mainland. Land. Unsatisfied with this draft of the script and feeling like it told the same old story of dinosaurs chasing humans in a jungle, Spielberg decided to take an entirely different approach and hired John Sayles to take a crack at it, who was famous for writing horror scripts such as Piranha, Alligator, The Howling, and Night Skies, which would eventually evolve into E.T. the Extraterrestrial. His version would open with dinosaurs terrorizing a Little League baseball game as we come to learn that Hammond's company InGen, as well as the island of Isla Nublar, from the first film have been taken over by the Grendel Corporation, a Swiss company who claims to have cleansed the island of all dinosaurs. But that hasn't stopped several smaller creatures from escaping to the outside world and wreaking havoc. With the frequency of these attacks on the rise, Hammond, now the most sued person in the history of the world, formulates a plan to create a new breed of highly aggressive but infertile dinosaurs to destroy the surviving creatures terrorizing people around the world. There's just one problem. The UN has outlawed the cloning of dinosaurs and and the sale of amber. So Hammond enlists the help of an ex-Navy SEAL named Nick Harris to retrieve the DNA samples that were stolen by Nedry in the original film and hidden in a shaving cream canister that was left in the mud. Here's where the story briefly turns into a version of Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell, as Harris uses his military training to infiltrate the heavily guarded Isla Nublar, sneaking past Grendel's security team before locating the missing canister. In a nice touch, Harris finds Nedry's skeleton still in the car and quips, looks like he dropped 
a few pounds. It's not long, however, before Harris is ambushed by Grendel commandos, who are also after the canister. With his back up against the wall, Harris is saved by a bunch of raptors who eat the commandos for lunch, as he realizes that the reports that all of the island's dinosaurs have been wiped out is false. Harris makes a run for it, but his escaped attempt is thwarted when a colossal sea creature destroys his plane. Eventually, he's able to make it to a nearby island, where he manages to hide the canister in a beer chest at a local bar before being abducted by the Grendel Corporation, knocked unconscious, and taken to Europe. It's at this point that the script goes off the rails, as Harris wakes up in a medieval castle in the Swiss Alps, which serves as the Grendel Corp's headquarters slash genetics lab. Here, Harris meets Grendel's CEO, Baron Von Drax, who feels lifted straight out of a Bond film. Drax is breeding and training genetically modified raptors, or rather cousins of the raptors that are twice the size that also contain DNA from dogs to foster obedience and humans to increase problem solving ability. Clever girl. <laughs> These raptors can also camouflage their skin to disappear into their surroundings. Now is a good time to address the leaked concept art by Carlos Wente, which saw some bonkers human-dinosaur hybrid designs, including Raptor Man, who has a gun for an arm. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on if you're a fan of these designs or not, these probably wouldn't have been what the genetically modified dinosaurs in the film looked like, as Carlos has said some of these designs were rejected or just drawn in his spare time for fun. However, while the script was in development, Jack Horner, renowned paleontologist and the technical advisor to the Jurassic Park films, was asked on a public radio show about what a man would look like if humans had evolved from dinosaurs instead of mammals. Horner responded by saying, in a couple of years, go see Jurassic Park 4. So it looks like we have some conflicting information here. Even though in the script that leaked, the hybrid dinosaurs are described as looking similar to raptors. There were other drafts written too, and this script was also revised, so it's entirely possible at one point, Spielberg was considering bolder designs for the hybrid that look just like these. And with the plethora of leaked concept art that we have, I wonder if where there's smoke, there's fire. Harris is given a tour of the facility by a geneticist named Maya, who explains that Von Drax and a scientist plan to turn the genetically modified raptors into trained super soldiers, controlled by a neural implant on the side of their heads. Von Drax pressures Harris to reveal the location of the Barbasol can, but Harris refuses, so to try and persuade him, Von Drax offers Harris the chance to work for him and train and lead a pack of genetically modified raptors. Harris accepts and then names each raptor after a classical character from Greek mythology. After Harris trains the raptors and puts them through their paces, he's assigned with rescuing a 10-year-old girl kidnapped by a group of terrorists in Tangier. From an SUV parked a few yards away, Harris dispatches his squad of armor-clad raptors who proceed to converge on the warehouse where the girl is being held. And what follows is about what you'd expect as the raptors kill the terrorists while Harris rescues the girl. Following this, Harris is convinced to lead his raptors and a pair of spitters, like the one who killed Nedry in the first film, on a mission to a drug lair. Leading up to this, however, the raptors begin exhibiting signs of defiance before Harris learns that Maya, the geneticist, is being held at the castle against her will and being forced to work for Von Drax. Harris barters with Von Drax and agrees to reveal the location of the Barbasol can in exchange for him freeing Maya once the next mission is over. Later, in private, Maya tells Harris that Von Drax had arranged to have that little girl kidnapped. Harris goes ahead with the final mission as representatives from militaries and companies around the world are on hand to watch the raid as Grendel tries to win their business. As Harris leads the raid on the drug compound, the dinosaurs make quick work of the drug lord and his goons. Harris then learns that Von Drax was paid by a rival gang to take these guys out before Von Drax is informed that the dinosaur embryos and the Barbasol can they recovered were removed and replaced with frog embryos by Harris. Before Von Drax can protest, however, his dinosaurs remove their implants and begin to turn on Von Drax and his team, killing them all but sparing Harris and Maya. As the dinosaurs disappear into the jungle, Harris reveals to Maya that he's been playing Von Drax all along, and that he always intended to honor his deal with John Hammond. The film ends with Harris hoping that what Hammond does with the dinosaur embryos he took from the canister will turn out better than the last time. The biggest takeaway from the script is that it feels less like a Jurassic Park film and more like an action horror 
horror B movie, which serves as a poignant reminder that it takes more than just dinosaurs to make a Jurassic Park film. FX wizard Stan Winston would elaborate on this and also hint at why this version of Jurassic Park was ultimately scrapped, saying, Spielberg wasn't very enthused with the first couple of screenplay drafts. I think he felt neither of them balanced the science and adventure elements effectively. It's a tough compromise to reach as too much science will make the movie too talky, but too much adventure will make it seem hollow. As Spielberg continued to explore other ideas and commission scripts from different writers, tragedy would strike as Michael Crichton would pass away, prompting producer Kathleen Kennedy to wonder if maybe that was a sign they shouldn't pursue another Jurassic Park film. Around this time, Kathleen Kennedy was looking for a director for The Force Awakens and approached Brad Bird, who had recently taken the leap from directing animated hits like The Incredibles and Ratatouille to live action films with Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Bird, however, was busy completing his film Tomorrowland, so suggested that upcoming director Colin Trevorrow stand in for him during the pre-production of The Force Awakens until Bird could take over for him once Tomorrowland was finished. With Kennedy's interest peaked, she checked out Colin's independent film, Safety Not Guaranteed. Impressed by its quality, she not only recommended it to Steven Spielberg to watch, but also suggested Trevorrow as the perfect director for Jurassic Park 4. While meeting with Colin, Spielberg realized he was deeply steeped in Jurassic Park and would bring a sense of childlike wonder to the film and was hired. But after reading the previous draft of the script, Colin insisted on completely rewriting it. Spielberg, realizing previous attempts had strayed too far from what made Jurassic Park a phenomenon, agreed, but had four conditions. The script needed to include children, a fully functioning dinosaur theme park, a human who has a relationship with trained raptors, and a human eating dinosaur that escapes and has to be stopped. Colin agreed and, unlike Joe Johnson on Jurassic Park 3, came back to Spielberg with a fully formed story. He had a story to tell. He didn't just come in and say, I'd like to render my services directing the fourth installment. He came in with an actual story and just on paper, even before there was a screenplay, his story worked. A few months after being hired, Colin read through each of the previous drafts for the film and found the John Sayles draft with the human-dinosaur hybrids fascinating. He would go on to say that there were a lot of things that I loved about it. It was properly bonkers. I was interested in what the Sayles script was trying to do because it was so daring. It tried to do something different. It was trying to set a tone for how far forward we needed to push. Trevorrow's affection for the script is clear, as many of the ideas from it he'd repurposed for Jurassic World, such as genetically modified dinosaurs, the Harris character evolving into Chris Pratt's raptor tamer character, the dinos being able to camouflage themselves, and Von Drax's plan to turn the dinosaurs into super soldiers is similar to the goal of the character played by Vincent D'Onofrio. However, Trevorrow felt that the sales script may have taken things a little too far and wisely scaled back many of these ideas. And like the sales script, Trevorrow didn't want to include previous characters from the series in the new film without a good reason for their return, stating, I respect those actors too much to shoehorn them into the this story for my own sentimental reasons. Jurassic Park isn't about the bad luck of three people who keep getting thrown into the same situation. The only reason they go back to the island is if the screenwriters contrived a reason for them to go. This is why Dr. Henry Wu, the scientist responsible for recreating dinosaurs, was the only legacy character brought back, as it made logical sense to do so within the story. And similar to The Force Awakens, Colin stated that Jurassic World isn't a sequel or a reboot or a remake, but all of those things in one. And while Jurassic World was enormously successful in reviving the franchise for a new generation... Jurassic is number one. Remember that. Should I... The job is they have to crush you like a bug. Unfortunately, like Force Awakens, the sequels to both It and Jurassic World would fall short. But with Dominion concluding the second film trilogy, the franchise's producers are left in the same spot they found themselves in after Jurassic Park 3, as they wonder where to go next. Thanks for watching everybody, and don't forget to like and subscribe to Bullets and Blockbusters for more great content.